Hi, I'm Susan Biggs, Director of the Sydney Peace Foundation. Welcome to A Climate of Peace. Today I'm joined by Councillor Jess Miller, who was elected to the City of Sydney as part of the Clovermore Independent Team in 2016. Part of her motivation for being on council was to ensure that views of younger people were represented and that the city continues to set a global example of how to deal with the changing climate. Jess's key areas of expertise are in environmental systems, specifically urban ecology and urban forestry and local food systems. Welcome to A Climate of Peace and to Jess Miller. So Jess, the City of Sydney declared a climate emergency in June 2019, stating that climate change poses a serious risk to the people of Sydney. Why did the council do that? Uh, because we believe in science. Um, but I think more than that, what our job as city leaders is, is to really represent the views and the opinions and the concerns of our community. Um, and we've known because we ask um, that, you know, the majority of people who live in the city of Sydney um, believe the science, they are concerned. And so we're just really um, acting in, in accordance with community expectation. Okay, so what changes has the city made? Well, since we've declared the climate emergency, we've brought forward a lot of our targets. So um, in particular, we have, um, we had a goal to reach our net zero emissions by 2036. So we've brought that forward. Um, actually, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, so we had sorry, so we had a um, we had a twenty thirty target of of reducing our emissions by seventy percent, um, but we will we'll, we will have achieved that by twenty twenty four. So really, all it means in terms of a climate emergency frame is that all the work that we had in the pipeline is coming forward much sooner. So um, I guess the the biggest move that we've made in recent times is. We've spent $600 million on a renewable energy purchase um, and we've also ensured that that purchase benefits community energy projects in New South Wales. So we're also aware that alongside this change, we have to ensure that we're um, providing a fair and equitable transition to communities um, in New South Wales. And, and what does that energy um, project look like? I think there are two wind energy and so two wind projects and one solar project. Mm. Um, one of them is based in Shoalhaven. One I think is out near Wagga, and then there's a, a third one. So, um, as we were procuring those projects, we were very mindful and we asked the staff to do more. We asked the staff to not just go through a traditional procurement route whereby we were buying it through a broker to the major companies that also deal in coal and gas. We wanted to ensure that um, these projects were assisting that, that just transition and that they were um, really building capacity, building knowledge and building jobs in communities um, that really needed them. And it was great that we did so because it, it, as it happened, um, most of those communities were, were actually in bushfire affected areas. Mm. Uh, from last year as well so mm. yeah so you think you're um you think that it's possible to have alternate energy that people need as well as creating jobs in the community yeah well i mean the thing about the thing about our our renewable energy buyers was actually cheaper <laughs> so um not it not only does it make a world of sense from an environmental viewpoint but um the changes that we're seeing at the moment means that renewable energy is actually much more, much more um, cost effective anyway. So it just makes sense. Yeah, it sounds like a win-win. Completely, yeah. Mm. So uh, what do you see are the consequences for a peaceful and just society of a continued failure for us as a country to address climate change? Yeah, I mean, what climate change does is that systemically it exacerbates all of the inequities and all of the problems that already exist within a society. So um, 
within an urban context and within Sydney, I think urban heat is probably the biggest issue and, and one of the realest incidences of climate change. Um, and when we have those hot summers, I think it's really easy to sometimes forget and join the dots between climate change and what people are experiencing. Um, but we know that when the grid is overloaded, because people who can afford it are turning on their air conditioning, um, that the heat that is released from the air conditioning creates a much more intense urban heat island effect. We know that when the road temperature, the, the, the temperatures of the road surfaces um, increase, that that sets off another chain reaction with chemicals that are released from the road that um, adds to respiratory illness and respiratory problems for people in those communities. Um, you know, people who are elderly and already have underlying chronic health issues are much more at risk of dying in heat waves. And it, it's, it's one of those things I think that um, kind of creeps up on us as a community and we don't fully appreciate how devastating it is and how many lives are actually lost during heat waves. Um, it also disrupts our infrastructure, which causes problems with the economy. And it's more often people who are already uh, vulnerable, who already don't have access to quality housing, to cooling, um, who don't have lots of trees and parks in their areas who are worst affected. Um, so it is fundamentally an issue of equity. Um, and what climate change really does is, is exacerbate the underlying injustices that already exist. Mm -hmm. So if there's one action that the world could take to move towards a safe climate, what in your opinion would that be? We've got to not only get the emissions down rapidly, um, but we have to get the emissions down in a way that reimagines an economic system for the better. And I think what's happened in these past 12 months through COVID um, is, has definitely been a dress rehearsal for the worst outcomes that climate change will, will put into play. Um, but it's also invited us as a, as a whole society and as an entire world um, to rethink and reimagine our economies. And we can't possibly address climate change without addressing all of the other systemic inequities that already exist. Um, it's those systemic inequities that got us to this point, and it's got to be those systemic equities that get us out of this point. So um, I think, yeah, it's returning and appreciating what natural systems are. I'm really excited about these ideas around regenerative cities, regenerative agriculture. Um, it has to be linked to the welfare of Indigenous and First Nations people, of women, and it has to be inclusive. Um, I firmly believe that human beings have an enormous capacity for creativity and kindness, and I think we've seen a lot of that um, come to the fore throughout COVID. And so really it's just managing up those political systems who seem to get in the way. And if they are getting in the way, it's moving around them. And I think that's what we've seen, um, you know, some companies doing and the market doing when it comes to renewable energy. So it's really just that writ large and not underestimating the power that local communities can have to bring about very transformative outcomes. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more. Thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you. That is my last question. We really appreciate being with us today. Thank you, Councillor Jess Miller, for speaking to us today. And thank you for your part in ensuring the City of Sydney sets a global example of how to deal with the changing climate. For everybody out there, I hope you enjoyed this session of A Climate of Peace. The Sydney Peace Foundation exists to advocate for peace with justice. Find out more and support our work by following our social media pages or checking us out online. Bye for now.